Hello, I'm Nick Clark. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, spending more money to buy guns. Many European nations turn to American-made weapons after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So what's behind the increase in defence spending and who's reaping the profit? Also this week, the Ukraine crisis is disrupting global trade and it's coming for the car industry. Kyiv halted half of the world's neon output needed for vehicle microchips. How are car makers going to cope? Sub-Saharan Africa is the world's least connected region, but Google's underwater cable aims to improve internet access to the region. Can the project really help millions of Africans connect to the rest of the world? All right, peace has existed for decades across much of Europe since World War II. But Russia's invasion of Ukraine has alerted the continent that it is not guaranteed. There have been calls for an EU army and many European countries are now reassessing their defence policies. Several governments have already increased their military budgets, some of them significantly. Germany alone has announced it will allocate more than 110 billion US dollars to military funding. And that marked a major policy shift. Now the nation has approached the US to buy F-35 fighter jets capable of carrying nuclear weapons. Poland also wants to purchase sophisticated Reaper drone systems from the US. And many other European governments are turning to Washington to buy drones, missiles and other weapons. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is believed to have increased demand for US arms. The Stockholm International Peace Research Institute says even before Russia went to war with Ukraine, European arms imports were increasing. The continent accounted for 13% of global arms transfers between 2017 and 2021, and that is up 10% in the previous five-year period. The UK, Norway and the Netherlands were the largest European buyers, but it is Asia and Oceania who remain the world's biggest importers, receiving 43% of global transfers since 2017. India tops the world's list while Australia, China, South Korea, Pakistan and Japan were also among the top 10 buyers of arms. The United States leads the sale of arms and its export shares rose to 39% over the last five years. Russia and China have decreased to 19% and 4.6% respectively. But beyond the top exporters, there are also many other potential beneficiaries in the Ukraine war. Turkey has supplied Kyiv with weapons, including Bayraktar TB2 high-tech drones, which have bolstered Ukraine's defences. Al Jazeera's defence analyst Alex Gotopoulos reports now from the annual Maritime Defence Expo in Doha. Turkey's defence exports around the world have increased dramatically in the last few years. And the standard bearer for these locally made weapon systems is the Bayraktar TB2 combat drone. Now, it's not the fastest drone in the world, and it's not the most heavily armed. But what it does do is it gives militaries a cost-effective means of being able to spot your enemy, being able to destroy them if need be, and also filming those successes in glorious HD video. We've seen these videos in Azerbaijan, northern Syria, Libya, and now over the skies of Ukraine. Now, for Turkey, this is just the beginning. They're building equipment like multi-role helicopters seen here, helicopter landing ships, and turning their sights to fifth-generation aircraft. This is only the beginning, they say, for Turkey's defense exports. Alex Kotopoulos for Counting the Cost. And the defense industry is quietly making billions of dollars of profit from the war. The potential for a surge in sales of all types of weaponry has lifted Lockheed stock 8.3% and Raytheon shares 3.9%. BAE Systems, the largest contractor in the UK and Europe, is up 26%. Of the world's top five firms by revenue, only Boeing has seen a drop. Well, to discuss all of that, I'm joined from Stockholm by Pieter Weizemann, who's a senior researcher at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. Mr. Weizemann, welcome to the programme. So, first of all, do you think this heralds a global rush to buy arms as nations up their defence budgets, or is it just driven principally by European concerns about the Russian invasion? 
The uh, Russian invasion in Ukraine definitely is going to push European states to acquire more arms, exactly how many we have to see, but that's something which we can expect, which we already saw in the previous five years, that there is an increase, for example, in arms imports by European states, but also the rest of the world. There are plenty of other regions where the tensions are high and where countries have and also will continue to invest in new arms. The the Middle East is an obvious region where this has happened, but we can also, for example, point at the uh, major tensions that exist between uh, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, the US on the one hand, on the other hand, China, and also those will drive continuing large uh, arms sales and arms, arms imports by those states. And in fact, as you say, purchases in Europe were on the up anyway, ahead of this conflict in Ukraine. Uh, following Russia's annexation of Crimea. Correct. Um, that was a very important reason for European states to revisit their um, defence policies and to look at their military capabilities. And of course, that came at the same time as Europe was climbing out of an economic crisis uh, related to, uh, to, to the 2008 financial crisis. And all that together already led to a significant increase in arms um, imports by several European states and significant large orders that have been placed by a number of other European states uh, in the past five years. You mentioned ongoing conflicts and tensions around the world. To what degree does uh, the invasion of Ukraine affect the demand for arms sales around the world, not, not just within Europe? I think it affects the demand for arms in several ways. In the first place, um, uh, Europe um, and the US will look at Russia, but at the same time is also aware of what's happening elsewhere in the world. And that will continue to contribute to that demand for arms in U Europe. But elsewhere, we can also question, for example, how will China react to this? Will China consider this an opportunity to step up the pressure? How will states in Asia react to that again? And will they therefore also see this as yet an additional reason to also bolster their military cap 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 capabilities? So these things hang closely together. At the same time, there are then also major questions about the role that Russia can play as a military supplier from now on. As states may feel that they don't want to side with Russia, they may feel that they are pressured by especially the US to take a step away from Russia, including from Russia as an arms supplier. And finally, also how states will deal with the difficulties uh, of paying Russia right now, including for arms that they may buy. All right. So and outside of the conflict in Ukraine, how concerned should we be about this arms build up? I think these arms buildups uh, are not necessarily always leading to war, but um, here at Cypri and I think many uh, um, together with, with, with with us uh, argue that they provide an insight in the kind of threats that are being perceived and the um, stress that is being put on military capacity as a tool to deal with those security threats. And that in itself is a concern. And of course, it is also a concern that the increase in arms imports by one side often leads to an increase uh, in arms Im Im imports by the opposing side, leading to uh, reactive arms dynamics and even potentially to arms raises which will not contribute to peaceful solutions no. to the tensions that we see. Indeed. We've been seeing how European countries have been buying from the United States, but what about the defence industries on the continent itself? How does it affect them? The demand for arms in Europe that we already have seen and that we expect to increase um, is is fed by um, or is, is kind of catered for by industries in um, both the US and in Europe. The US has certain technology to offer which Europe cannot really match exactly. And secondly, also European states feel that they need to maintain their strong security relations with the US and buying arms is one aspect of that. Uh, At the same time, there are other items which the US cannot supply, for example, advanced chips. That's something which European states are much better at. Right. I guess it is, in fact, arms manufacturers who are the only ones who relish a situation like this, the profits just soar at a time like this. 
Yeah, I'm afraid that it is true that the arms in, in the industry will ben, ben benefit from the war in Ukraine. Um, that is to be expected, just like the pharmaceutical industry has benefited from um, the uh, pandemic over the past two years. Can you put a, a figure on the world's arms uh, turnover? If you look at the turnover of the arms industry as a whole, if you look at the 100 largest arms producing companies in the world, what they sell to their own countries and what they export together, it's something in the order of magnitude of 550 to 600 billion dollars in, in the most recent year. If you look at arms trade, so the trade between countries, then that makes up something like about 120 billion dollars per year. That sounds like a lot. It is a lot, of course. But if you compare it with the total uh, manufacturing and the total revenue of the complete industry in the world, it's only a fraction of that. It's maybe 1% or 0.5 of all exports in the world. Right. Still an extraordinary amount of money. You have to say that kind of cash could go a long way for peaceful purposes. Uh, but such is the world we live in there, Pieter Wiesemann. Appreciate your analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you. While arms producers, military and security industries are expanding profits, car manufacturers are being hit hard by the war in Ukraine. As it was, fewer people were buying cars because of the pandemic. But after Russia's invasion of its neighbour, vehicles could become even more expensive and difficult to source. Ukraine is a major hub for many components used in semiconductor manufacturing, and car dealers say sales will be affected by shortages. Ukraine's two leading suppliers of Neon, which produce about half of the world's supply of the key ingredient for making chips, have halted their operations as Moscow has intensified its attack on the country. The global supply chains already face a chip crunch because of the coronavirus pandemic, and that impacts almost everything we buy from electronics to cars. The country is also a key source of nickel ore, which is used to make batteries for electric vehicles. And Russia is one of the largest producers of rare earth metals, especially palladium, which is also an essential metal for semiconductors. It's estimated vehicle production could be down as much as 15% in Europe in the first half of this year. BMW has said that production at its factories will return to normal after shutdowns caused by parts shortages. Other car makers were forced to slow production including Audi, Mercedes-Benz and Porsche. Uh, let's take this on. Joining us now from London is Andy Leyland. He's the Managing Director at Supply Chain Insights. Andy Leyland, welcome to the show. Uh, the supply chain was already in deep trouble. Then the invasion of Ukraine happened. It's made it a lot worse. It has indeed. And, you know, what a lot of people don't realise is just how interconnected the supply chains, particularly for the automotive market, is. And, you know, disruptions that we're seeing in both Russia and Ukraine and to a lesser extent to transport networks which go through those countries has really seen the automotive industry taking a, another hit to its supply chains, which were only recovering, only just recovering from, uh, from the pandemic. So when we talk about the supply chain being in trouble, is that what it is? It's, it's the, the logistical issue of getting products from A to B and you just can't do it through a war zone? <clears throat> Exactly. And obviously production stops in that war zone. So we've seen shortages in, in things like vehicle components, electrical harnesses coming from Ukraine. And then also we see the impact of sanctions um, both on Russia and actually some of the sanctions that Russia have placed on the West in, in restricting its exports of particular raw materials. So, you know, you are seeing impacts there on markets where you have a restriction in a relatively small amount of supply. But because of the way that these commodities are priced, that has a huge impact on prices and costs of production. Ukraine is halting the production of neon, uh, which is a, a critical component. How is that going to impact consumers and manufacturers? Yeah, so the, the neon market is actually a really good example of the interconnectedness of international supply chains. It's primarily used in the manufacture of semiconductors, which, as you may be aware, were already in short supply, um, particularly in the automotive industry. So it really further sort of compounds those problems. Um, there's also a lot of neon supply that actually comes from Russia as well. 
um, which presumably is, is going to be impacted. And what that means is all of these particular semiconductors, which are integral to vehicle production, and all of the little computers that you have in, in modern automotive vehicles are, are not going to be there. And, you know, if you think of a, a vehicle as, you know, potentially 15,000 different components, if you don't have one of them, the, the other 15,000 are, are not particularly useful. Right. So, so how are industries and, and businesses and, and car manufacturers going to cope? Well, it's, it's really a sort of short term or medium term problem. Um, typically, when you are setting up a supply chain, you will have more than one provider. So you go to your other providers to try and make up the shortfall. Um, that obviously has an impact in terms of can they increase their production? Well, in this case, probably not because they're already being asked to. Um, so you either have to uh, reduce your, your output, uh, at least in the, the short term, and also you probably have to increase prices. And indeed, we, we have already seen uh, production cost increases being passed on to the consumer for, for vehicles, and in particular for electric vehicles. I've noticed it's even had a, an effect on hiring cars, isn't it? The cost of rental cars has rocketed. Yeah, and you know that that's an industry that's really been decimated over the course of the pandemic, with a lot less business travel and a lot less tourism. And what it's seen is that that industry has actually had to reduce its sort of uh, economy of scale. Um, so effectively, you know, rental car prices are likely to be significantly higher for quite a bit longer until both the, the tourism market recovers and sort of international business travel as well. And then you've got the knock on impact of the, the vehicles that they're using are more expensive. And then obviously they need to charge that higher cost, um, need to pass that on to the consumer. With a, a need to reduce emissions, there's been a big push towards electric vehicles. What's going to be the impact on that? Well, electric vehicles have, you know, much newer and less robust supply chains. So when we look at some of the materials that go into lithium ion batteries, in particular nickel, these have seen really big increases in price um, because of the supply chain disruption coming from, from Russia. And indeed, there, what you actually saw in the nickel market was a, a short squeeze happening over the past couple of weeks. Prices quadrupled in very short order, even though they are now settling back down. And if prices stay at that level, you know, that adds, uh, you know, almost $1,000 to the cost of any reasonable sized electric vehicle. And eventually that would need to be passed on to the consumer. And, you know, particularly for electric vehicles where what they're trying to do is come down in sticker price for those uh, so that they are more mass market available, those price increases really hurt them because, you know, ultimately an electric vehicle is a, a substitute product. And if it is substantially more expensive, then people will stick to buying uh, diesel and gasoline powered vehicles. Uh, briefly, Andy, uh, can the car industry soak this up or are we looking at job losses? I think mean, certainly the, the car industry will soak it up because demand is still there. Um, you may have sort of short term production outages at certain plants, but, you know, the, the industry is quite resilient. They do plan for this. Um, and ultimately, any any sort of job losses are, are likely to be in the, the short term uh, due to, to sort of short term supply constraints. All right, Andy. Appreciate that. Andy Leyland there. Thank you. Countries are moving ahead with the latest generation of 5G mobile networks, but on the African continent, many people hardly have access to the internet at all. In sub-Saharan Africa alone, nearly a quarter of the population lacks mobile broadband coverage, compared to 7% globally. But that is about to change. A new underwater internet cable has wound its way from Portugal to Togo. It will land in Nigeria, Namibia and South Africa later this year, linking Africa to Europe. The Equiano subsea internet cable is part of Google's $1 billion program to build digital capacity on the continent. And it's expected to deliver 20 times more internet capacity to the region and reduce prices by around 14%. And that is particularly important for Togo, which is among the highest mobile data costs on the continent at around $9 per gigabyte. The project is the company's third private international underwater cable, and it's the first in Africa. Google, along with Meta, Microsoft and Amazon, now dominate the world's cable infrastructure. Meta announced plans to build at least two transatlantic undersea cables by 2027, last month. But undersea cables do have a serious downside. The cables can tear and break, leaving entire regions without connectivity for days.
Well, joining us from Singapore now is Nitin Gadria, the Managing Director of Sub-Saharan Africa at Google. Nitin, welcome to the show. Uh, so this cable is really going to be a game changer for internet access across Africa. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, we've just uh, launched uh, Equiano, which is what we're calling our subsea cable that extends from Europe all the way uh, along the west coast of Africa down to South Africa. Uh, we've just had our first landing last week uh, in Lome in Togo. Uh, this cable is, is uh, remarkable, and I'm really excited about what this brings to the continent because it brings in 20 times more network capacity than the last cable built to serve the region. And the knock-on effects of this are going to be plenty, whether you look at GDP growth and job creation, whether you look at the growth of digital economies, uh, whether you look at the knock-on effect on cost of data and internet speeds and uh, internet reliability across the continent. Uh, some really exciting things to come down the pipe. Right. And you say first landing in, in Togo. And Togo as a hub, I, I presume that means it could really reap the dividends. Absolutely. Uh, not just Togo, but we, we, we're going to have uh, further landings uh, as we get to Nigeria and then down to Namibia, uh, as well as South Africa uh, as, and, and also St. Helena. So uh, we, are, we, we, we do have landings planned across each of these countries. And uh, Togo has been the first one. And absolutely, uh, you know, in interacting with the government of, uh, of, of Togo over the course of the last week, I'm really excited about the digital agenda that they've built. They have a very deliberate and well thought through plan for uh, digitization going to 2025. And uh, government initiatives across different parts of, uh, of government are already adopting uh, the digital agenda very, very uh, aggressively and progressively. So uh, really excited about uh, what's happening in Togo. Uh, the cable is one thing, but the infrastructure that needs to follow is another, isn't it? Absolutely. So um, the way I see this is this is the starting point. You need the cable. Uh, you, you, you need this kind of capacity to come into a particular country, a particular region. Uh, it needs to come into the continent. What needs to happen from here is the entire ecosystem of, uh, of, of network players, whether that's ISPs, telcos, uh, any other uh, infrastructure players. Uh, this entire sector needs to work together to now bring uh, this connectivity uh, deeper into various countries into landlocked countries and, uh, and, and so on. So uh, still a lot of work to be done, but this is an important and essential first step. It's a competitive market, important this, uh, no doubt, for Google to get a, a good foothold in Africa. What's the bottom line there? I mean, Google will profit enormously too, I guess. Well, the way, th the way we think about this is uh, our core mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And uh, if you think about the context of Africa, there's still about 800 million people, which is a staggeringly large number, 800 million people that have never experienced the internet. So we're looking forward to the next several years when these, when these 800 million people are gonna come online and we wanna create capacity for these people to come online and have a great experience on the internet. What remains to be seen is how these 800 million people use the internet, what they're gonna do with the internet, what kind of problems will they solve? What kind of value will they create with, uh, with uh, newfound access to the internet? So I'm really, really pumped about what that looks like. Uh, one thing, these cab cables do have a habit of breaking, don't they? You've got nation's economies relying on a, on a bundle of wires lying on the seabed. Yeah, um, we've, again, Google has been involved in a, in a ton of uh, cable work all across uh, the world. And uh, our engineers do a fantastic job of ensuring reliability, ensuring uh, in, ensuring there are, there are fail-safe models built into, uh, into uh, this kind of work that we do. Uh, the cable that we've just laid with Equiano is, uh, is again, a state-of-the-art cable with, uh, with uh, incredible backup systems built into uh, how this cable is going to function. So I'm not, uh, I'm not concerned about reliability at this point at all. Why did you choose Togo as the, the first landing point? Because the initial plan suggested it would first branch out in, in Lagos, in Nigeria, didn't it? Well, geographically, when you sort of go from uh, Europe to, uh, to Africa, and as you sort of lay, uh, lay the geography down, Togo just sort of comes before uh, Nigeria. That's, that's one thing. But in early discussions with the Togolese government, uh, what became amply clear is, uh, like, I, like I mentioned earlier, a very clear intention to drive digitization for Togo. They have a very clear digital agenda, a very clear plan to get to 2025, uh, which uh, runs across the government. Last year, we've seen the launch of uh, the first tier three data center in, uh, in Togo. This year, we've seen the landing of Equiano. 
uh, and in, in, in speaking to, uh, to various uh, government officials in Togo, I'm really excited about what they've got planned. So Togo was a great first step, but uh, like I mentioned, uh, we're looking at uh, landing this in Nigeria in the coming weeks, uh, followed by Namibia and South Africa. Indeed, exciting times. Nitin Gajria, appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that is our show for this week. If you'd like to comment on anything you've seen, you can tweet me at Nick Clark Al Jazz. Please use the hashtag AJCTC or just drop us an email. Kind to the cost at aljazeera.net is our address. But there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That will take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links and entire episodes for you to catch up on. And that's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Nick Clark from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is coming up.